ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المحتد ومن يذل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الناس ان خلقناكم من ذكر وانثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وكبائل لتعارفوا ان اكرمكم عند الله اتقاكم يا ايها الذين امنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوا بكره واصيلا صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله indeed all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has blessed us to gather once again on this yawm al-jum'ah this day of forgiveness this day of blessing this day in which the dua is accepted this day of celebration for the believer and alhamdulillah i congratulate everyone here for this new juma space that has been provided by Rutgers University and inshallah ta'ala we pray that Allah ta'ala gives this longevity and the ability of the students here to gather once a week to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to remember his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and to carry out this most beautiful of rituals in our faith we are now on the last friday of the month of march which is the month which is dedicated what we know as women's history month a month that is celebrated in this country as well as in nations around the world attempting to recognize the contributions of women to history to civilization to culture to humanity and why was this month or the need for this month created it was because of the marginalization that we find of women throughout history and and nearly every time and nearly every culture and society and that marginalization often times led to actually oppression of women and that's why they were marginalized dominated by societies patriarchal societies etc and they were marginalized and so they it was found or argued that it was necessary to at least spend some time to reflect upon the contributions that women had left and so we're using this as a pretext i will talk briefly today about four of the greatest of all women that allah ta'ala had sent to this world and i mean all of them have a relationship to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is beyond any of our comprehension their maqam with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their station with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that i don't even think we could dream about so i'm not going to be addressing that what i want to look at though is the societies in which they were born into what it was and those cultures in which they were born into and in spite or because of those societies what they were able to achieve in their relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know from the tradition that the four greatest of all women who were created the first is the wife of pharaoh who we know in the tradition as asia the second is the mother of sayyidina isa alayhi salam prophet jesus peace be upon him maryam the third was Khadijah al-Kubra alayhi salam our beloved mother and wife of our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam and the fourth was their beloved daughter Fatima az-Zahra alayhi salam these four women all paradigms of virtue but all came in a different way and had a different challenges that they faced based upon the society in which they lived if we look to asia she was in the house of pharaoh 
We spend a lot of time looking at the life of Pharaoh and the oppression he had done to the Bani Israel. For his government and his governance at that time, oppression was not part of it. Oppression was the governance. Was the governance. He had declared himself as a lord. He created a society based upon oppression of all. And if we just take a moment, because we always look externally, what it would have been like to be living in the house of Pharaoh. What it would have been like to live in that house. The worst of men, the worst creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth was Pharaoh. The worst. And who is living in his household? The greatest of women. What a prison she was living in. And we know from tradition the torture that she had gone, that she had undergone even physical torture. And according to some of the Mufassirs, that actually she was killed eventually by her husband, Fir'aun. What was her dua? What was her dua? It's amazing in the Quran, in the brevity of just looking at the words of her dua, you get an indication of the torment that she was living under. She prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbibni li indaka baytan fil jannah. Oh my Lord, build me a home, a bait. This is a woman who was living in the greatest at that time that the world had to offer. The palaces, the castles. What does she want in Jannah? Just a home. A home. A home that had peace and sakina, free from the oppression of this man, Fir'aun. She had no one to turn to. She lived in a society where the only hope of the one to turn to was her husband, who was the source of all of the oppression. This was our mother Asiya. And in spite of the difficulties of her household and the society in which she lived, she, raised, she was raised to be amongst the greatest of women. If we look to Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of our beloved Prophet Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, what do we find? What is that society that she was born into? Again, a society that would be based upon the oppression and marginalization of women. When her mother cried out, as the Quran tells us, إِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانَ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطَنِي مُحَرَّرًا مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ فَلَمَّا وَدَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَدَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَدَعَتْ وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَى وَإِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا مَرْيَمْ وَإِنِّي عِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And mentioned in the book, when the wife of Imran, who we know in the tradition as Hannah, when she said to her Lord, My Lord, indeed I have pledged to you what is in my womb, consecrated for your service, so accept this from me. Indeed, you are the hearing, the knowing. But when she delivered her child, she said, My Lord, I have delivered a female. And Allah Ta'ala knows what she had delivered. And the male is not like the female. And she said, I have named her Mary. And I seek refuge for her, seek refuge in you and for her descendants from Shaitan. This was Hannah. She had tried to get pregnant for many years and Allah Ta'ala finally blessed her and she assumed and presumed that she had given or she was going to give birth to a male. And she wanted that male and that society, that patriarchal society, that male to be dedicated to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And when she gave birth and saw it was a female, <coughs> you could just imagine her anticipation, her fear, her anxiousness. 
that what she had promised to the Lord was other than what could be delivered or facilitated in that society. Allah Ta'ala though, when she was guided, she went to go live with Zakaria, who then took her into the temple at the time. As a young girl, consecrated to the temple as Hannah had promised. And Zakaria was the one who was willing to facilitate that. And as a young girl, she was alone. She had no one except her Lord. And in her development, in her spiritual development, she even came to the surprise of Zachariah whenever she was a young girl in the temple alone in the room, her mihrab. Whenever she would come, he would come, he would find her with sustenance, physical sustenance, not only spiritual. Physical sustenance provided to her. And he asked this young girl, where did you get this from? She said, oh, it's from my Lord. From my Lord. <laughs> that Allah Ta'ala provides the rizq without any recompense. This was Mary. Growing up in a very difficult situation as a woman. Being raised at that point to be one in which Allah Ta'ala is very close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But her challenges in that society did not end there. For she would be given, she would be, give birth to a child, be accused of the most horrendous of accusations in a society where honor mattered, or woman's honor mattered, not like today. And she would be accused of that at that time to the point that even she wished that she was not there. Because she knew what she was going to be facing by the men around her. And she knew what her son would face, a son without a father in that society. A single mother raising her child who would become one of the greatest of men. One of the greatest of men. Again, who did she have to turn to in a society that did not recognize or value her because of her gender? No. She turned to her Lord who raised her up to be amongst the greatest, Sayyid al Al-Alameen, amongst all of them. These two individuals, brothers and sisters, are pre- or the coming or came before the coming of our beloved Messenger What are the next two who came? They came in the presence of the Messenger of God. Again, in a society, in a culture, which was the worst of cultures in many ways at that time in their treatment of women, even going to the point of burying their own daughters alive as a sign of honor and manhood. And what do we find? The society in which the Prophet ﷺ began to try to create, first in Mecca and then into Medina, was one in which these practices, these cultural norms, these perceptions had to be eliminated. Had to be eliminated. And who did he rely on? His beloved wife. His beloved wife, Khadija. Who supported him from the beginning. In the most difficult of times and circumstances, she was there. She was involved. She was contributing to his da'wah, to the support of what in supporting everything that he was doing, whether it was financial, emotional, spiritual. She was there. And they raised in their household a daughter unlike any other daughter. Fatima Zahra. These were raised in the presence of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And what we find in the society that the Prophet was trying to create, we find for the first time outlets for people, outlets for those who are marginalized in society to go and to address their needs. When the Prophet comes to Medina 
And after the establishment of the mosque and the welcome of the people of Medina to the Prophet wasallam, the first issue he has to deal with societally is the woman of Medina coming forward and saying, our husbands beat us. What are you going to do about it? He has to deal with this from the outset of his mission. A society and a culture that was so constricting to women. And so he begins this process. And we have to recognize that the Prophet وسلم, throughout his life is in the process of developing people. These were not perfected human beings. The Sahaba. They were not. They had issues, they had problems. They had difficulties. They were in a society that produced not men, but in many ways animals. And he was in the process throughout his life of perfecting them. And so when we look at the great companions, we have to realize that they are the outcome and the product of a process of our Messenger وسلم, in removing those challenges, removing those things that they were born into, those societal norms and cultures, and bringing them out of it to become the great and perfected human beings that they were. A process. At the core of the oppression that usually women face in our societies and societies and cultures always begins in the home. The Qur'an describes the marital relationship which is the foundation of society. And especially many of you young people here, inshallah ta'ala, if you're not already looking to get married, remember this verse. Live this verse of the marriage that is described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَكَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكَوْمٍ يَتَفَكِّرُونَ That the marriage that is the sign of God is a marriage that is based upon tranquility through, the, through love and mercy. Love and mercy. This is the marriage the foundational relationship should be. Now, when we look to the Prophet وسلم, anything that disrupts this relationship of love and mercy should be left at the door. Whether it is stresses in life, whether it is in terms of how we interact with each other, how we resolve conflict, anything that does not facilitate love and mercy between the spouses should be left at the door. And that begins also with abuse. Domestic violence should be left at the door, should not be entering into our homes. And unfortunately, in spite of the efforts of our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to develop a society in which this would not become part of our households. We know from many of our cultures that it has persisted till this day. It was just two weeks ago I was talking to a young group of youth. And we were talking about the Messenger وسلم, and going through the various hadith, how he was described as the one who was the best to his family. How he never hit a woman or a child in his life. And a young 12-year-old girl raised her hand in her innocence and she said, so it's not okay to hit women? Our children should not be asking these questions. There's something wrong. If our children are asking these questions or if our conception is that this is okay. No. The marriage that Allah Ta'ala describes is one which is based upon love and mercy. Our Prophet was one who never struck a woman or a child. He had a life of Sakina in his home in spite of all of the difficulties. You only need to read the lives of the wives of the Prophet the struggles they had to go through. 
You know, some of the professors they describe this ayah wa min ayatihi that Allah Ta'ala describes as actually the marriage or a description of the marriage of the Prophet to Khadija. What benefit did Khadija have of this world? Whatever benefits maybe there was in Medina, she never tasted them of the prophetic message. She tasted hardship, difficulty, and being with her husband. But what? He was the source of her sakina. She was the source of his sakina in the home. This was the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Honoring, respecting, and encouraging others to do so of women. And providing those homes as homes of sakina. The best of men, he said, are those who are the best to their women. Manliness in a society was defined by how much they were willing to oppress women. How they viewed them, he struggled to change that conception within their lives. That no, the best of you would be those who would honor and show that respect. To provide that sense of sakina in the home. That's what our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam preached. That's what he taught. That's what he lived. That's what he lived. He described also the worst of people. The worst specifically of men. A hadith that I struggle with a lot coming home from work every day. What was the worst of men? Those when they enter the house those who are playing, stop playing. Those who are laughing, stop laughing. Those who are present, become absent. Awaiting for him to leave so that they can relax. What is that? The worst of men. People come home from work and all of a sudden the entire family is on eggshells. Men come home from work, their wives, their children are scared. Do not offend them. And how much even worse that maybe they're coming even from the masjid, from praying salah, coming into the house. Not only providing them that fear, but actually becoming an obstacle to their spouse or to their children's spiritual growth. What they call spiritual abuse that you actually become the source of people's distance from God, not the facilitation or the facilitating them toward God. The worst of people. And who's the worst of the worst? We just said it. Pharaoh is the worst of the worst. And it is narrated in the, tr in the tradition that the worst of men will be raised up with Pharaoh. Who are they? Are they the leaders of nations? No. Those who will be raised on the day of judgment with Pharaoh are those who are oppressors in their homes. <coughs> Pharaoh is not something or someone that is distant from us. We all have the potential to be Pharaoh in our place of authority. Or who we have authority over. We don't want to be raised amongst Pharaoh. We have to be brothers and sisters cognizant of this fact that abuse in our families has to stop. It has to stop. We know from the statistics that yes, those who are victims of abuse oftentimes become abusers. But that's no excuse. That's no excuse. Because I ask you this, when we look at the Sahaba and some of them like Sayyidina Umar, who were victims of a society, of a society, not only of a household, of a whole world view, they were victims of that. Sayyidina Umar used to bury his daughters. Who do 
we know who has reached that state of jahiliyyah in our lives? We don't. Yet, that was no excuse for Sayyidina Umar. He became the man that he was through the guidance of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A completely transformed individual. And many of the Sahaba the same. So yes, we do not believe, yes, there may be true about statistical, there are the statistics that talk about that. But we are not deterministic or so we don't follow these social theories that you are what you are a product of your environment and you can do nothing about it. No. The cycle stops with you. If you're a victim of abuse, you don't use it as an excuse to become an abuser. The cycle stops. Just as the cycle stopped with many of the Sahaba. It stopped with them. In spite of what their fathers and forefathers had done. In all elements of society, never mind only in the interaction with others. And oppression. Brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us on this day of Jummah that we may be forgiven. With Allah, ya Alhamdulillah, we are the Lord of the Lord, and 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 وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد. Brothers and sisters, United Nations has determined that there are at least forty percent of women reported. Of course, all these statistics when it comes to this are usually very much under reported. So they're usually it's considered to be much more. But forty percent of women throughout the world are victims of domestic abuse. So we wonder: Do Muslims do this? If you ask any imam, any religious leader, you will see that this is the case. I just spent two, three weeks ago, an entire weekend with imams and leaders throughout the country discussing Muslim, uh, domestic abuse with Muslim imams in our communities. The stories by the, by the religious leaders that they provide, what they're dealing with in their community, are scary. Are scary. And the perceptions that they're dealing with and trying to combat and they're due to cultural norms, are it's a daunting task. What disturbed me most about a statistic, though, that was done about Muslims in the United States is not that the abuse is happening, we know the abuse is happening. But when they had done, they found that 15%, 15% of people who knew of somebody who was being abused, only 15% did something about it. 85% of people who knew of somebody who was being abused, a friend or a relative, did nothing about it. Nothing. Not trying to follow up, not trying to resolve it, nothing. Never mind taking more measured responses. 85%. This, brothers and sisters, should be unacceptable to us as a community. We are to be the protectors of one another, as defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an. We are supposed to help our brother or our sister, whether they are what? The oppressor or the oppressed? The oppressor or the oppressed? How do we help them as, if they are the oppressor? As the companions asked their beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by stopping him from his oppression. By stopping him from his oppression. It should be unacceptable in our communities, in our societies, that any of our women have to be in a position of Asiya, where she feels she has no way out, no way out in that society. Or Maryam alayhi salam. No. 
Our example is the Messenger وسلم, where the women were able to come and have their problems addressed. To have their problems addressed. That they had a way out. Our example is our Messenger As we look at these times that we're in and the difficulties that we face, we oftentimes are looking overseas, we're looking at these grandiose events. We also have to look internally. Look into our own in, in state, especially as many of us are beginning that process of establishing our families, establishing our relations with others, that we do so with that spirit that the Messenger وسلم, was the embodiment of, and that was Rahm, mercy, mercy and compassion. And that any illnesses that we have in our hearts, any difficulties that we have that we were maybe subject to growing up, that we don't carry it on. We have one life. We have one life to rectify these situations and these diseases within our hearts. And we want to make it stop with us. That it's not for our children or grandchildren to be facing these things which maybe we inherited from other cultures back home. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us that we may be forgiven. We ask Him to bless us on this day of Jum'ah, that He show mercy upon us, that He grant us Jannah to the Firdaus, that he remove from our hearts anger and hatred and fill it with love and mercy. That he make us a community of compassion, a community of understanding, a community of love. That he puts in our hearts love for his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam, a love which is greater than the love in which we have for any other, any other thing or creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask that you grant us, Allah ta'ala, that he grant us an opportunity to visit him in this life, to be in with him, to be with our beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for all of eternity and Jannah. Ya Allah, we ask that you show, show our mercy upon this Ummah, that those of us who are victims of oppression, that the oppression be alleviated from us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask that you make us not to be amongst those who are oppressors, to raise us in the ranks of the Salihin, to raise us in the ranks of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who are suffering and struggling in your way throughout the world. We ask that you give them victory and success in this world and the next. Ya Allah, forgive us on this day of forgiveness. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-ahirati hasanatan wa kina ala abinnar. Rabbana kfidli wa li walidi wa li al-mu'minin yawma yakum al-hisar. Rabbana ahabnana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina kurrat ayona wa jahdin mutakina imama. Subhan rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ibadullah inna Allah ya'mur rabbil adli wa al-hisani wa ita'ad al-kurba wa yanha min al-fakshai wa al-mukhari wa al-bayi. Ya'udukum na'adukum tadakkarun. Thank you.